This is the journey of how we, the Canadian Unitarian Council, added an eighth principle to the existing seven. What is that principle? Individual and communal action to accountably dismantle racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and our institutions. But before we start at that story, a note about who we are. We are the Canadian Unitarian Council, the National Association of Unitarian and Universalist Congregations in Canada. We have agreed upon processes for proposing resolutions, getting feedback and making decisions at the national level. We were able to use these processes with our member congregations and delegates to come to a decision about that eight principle. Beverly Horton and Reverend Julie Stoneberg talk about how it began for them in June of 2016 at the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly. Yeah, so this was General Assembly 2017, and it was in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And um, the theme of the General Assembly that year was resist and rejoice, but it was coming right on the heels of a lot of um, um, chaos and tumult within the Unitarian Universalist Association that has sort of come to be known as the spring of our discontent. Yes. You know, and without giving a lot of details about that, much of the programming then at General Assembly had, I think, pivoted to be around um, a reckoning about um, racial justice and um, our own role in that. And so while the eighth principle had been um, being talked about before that year, um, it really got highlighted and seemed to be just in the water of everything that was happening at the General Assembly. What I remember, is sort of standing in the doorway or just walking over the threshold and kind of looking over at you and having one of those, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> which led to, why don't we go out for dinner and talk about this eighth principle business? Canadians generally think of themselves as being outside, existing outside of this conversation about race and racism more specifically. This would be a, a catalyst for a, a conversation around the realities of race and racism mm -hmm. uh, in Canada and its manifestation more specifically in the, the religious context of Canadian Unitarianism. <laughs> I don't remember the specifics of that conversation. No, I don't really remember much either, except that what I think is true is that we found kindred spirit in one yeah. another yeah. To, um, to move ahead with this, that we both were wandering around General Assembly going, man, this is so exciting. This is something that I want to get my hands and my toes and my life into and mm -hmm. without knowing how in the world we would do that. And so we found each other. We sat down uh, on a beautiful warm evening in yeah. New Orleans at this funky little patio, had a drink and some pizza or, or something <laughs> and, and realized how much both of us were passionate about this. I actually think Beverly that you invited me into it, mm -hmm. that I was probably a little more cautious, maybe just as not knowing if it was my work to move forward mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. be invited into. Mm -hmm. And so your invitation to me was a blessing and honor. It was important that the ways in which we are differently situated, that became important going down the road, like to have a lay person and a minister, to have a person of African descent and a person of uh, European descent working together but that, that it ended up being that way, the way the work can work most effectively. Trying to understand not just how we could bring it back to Canada, but really how do we as Canadians see this work mm -hmm. and how would it be approached and accepted? I think both of us clearly knew that the work is needed, mm -hmm. but we didn't know how to take it back. And we might've even started talking then about the process of bringing a resolution to the CUC. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and I think making a covenant with one another that we wanted to work on it together. Yes, um, yes. That's what that 
evening was about. Mm -hmm. Beverly and Julie did bring their proposal to the CUC's congregations at the 2018 annual general meeting, a proposal to adopt an eighth principle on dismantling racism. Feedback from congregations, however, indicated that they weren't ready to move ahead with this. So a study group was formed in 2019 to take the temperature of our congregations and to produce a report. I think we came back from General Assembly and we went on to make a deadline to plan that workshop. And at least in my mind, it was so obvious that this was something we should go ahead with, that that workshop was the beginning of understanding that people weren't at that place yet. And going back to that notion of racism not existing in Canada, this notion that we were pulling troubles from the south <laughs> bringing them north that was palpable in the initial responses to that resolution so it became very clear that we needed to to shift and i remember that conversation you know our process of looking at the responses of being one of real sadness mm -hmm. disappointment frustration and like recognizing that if we put this on the floor um, at that annual meeting, it wouldn't pass given the kind of feedback that there was. Mm -hmm. And then our conversation went to, well, is there an in-between step? How can we help prepare people? And that's when we changed it to a resolution to, to create a study, <laughs> a study group to move to what, you know, to find out really where we were at in terms of eighth principle type work in mm -hmm. Canada. So it was that resolution that was passed in 2019 and then right. the study group. Unani form. Unanimously. Unanimously, that's mm -hmm. correct. To form mm -hmm. a study group. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. In yeah. retrospect, that it, it seems kind of comical to me <laughs> because, you know, empiricism is so embedded in, and this, this um, cerebral way of being. So that, that became a sort of obvious way forward, but mm -hmm. I wanted to believe that everyone would see how important this was and would be able to skip over that step, right? We wouldn't have to study and provide data and provide a report to prove that this is important to the to the forward movement of our denomination. Well, it felt like colluding, right, with yes. white supremacy culture to say, yes. okay, then let's just do a study group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do some research. Yes. Given who I am, it's easy for me to collude with white supremacy culture. <laughs> but um, because that's no, how I was raised, right? Me. You know, it's who I am. Mm -hmm. So, but it was just so disappointing to say, oh, Man, why do we have to? Why do we have to take this sidestep? We heard repeatedly that IBPOC people in our communities did not want to do another survey, and and we did a survey, and they just did not want to see another survey, and they have told us over and over again what they need and what they want, and we did another survey to find out basically the exact same thing that there is racism in our congregations. Surprise! Big shocker. Uh, the report that we put out was not statistically rigorous in any way because we are a bunch of people who don't understand math that well trying to interpret all these numbers we got and we took a lot of heat for that and it took the conversation away from but people have been telling us what they want and what they need to feel accepted uh, which is the underlying point. When we entered the virtual space of that annual general meeting in May of 2021, I did not, could not have anticipated what would unfold over the next six months. I mean, after all, the agenda was standard. There were no out of the ordinary motions. We could, we would discuss and pass the budget, receive some reports, announce awards and grants, just like any other annual general meeting. One of the reports presented was from the Dismantling Racism Study Group. And one of the recommendations from that study group was to adopt an eighth principle on individual and communal action to accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. The intent at that AGM was only to acknowledge the report and to thank the study group, 
we hadn't had time to consider all the recommendations. However, a delegate from the floor spontaneously proposed adopting the eighth principle right then. I don't think we had any vision for when the eighth principle might be adopted. Right. You know, it was just one of the recommendations and we're moving on this path. So we got into that rhythm of the research and the careful consideration, mm -hmm. you know, and thank goodness for the holy disruptor yes. <laughs> who made yes. it happen differently. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so here we are online uh, having a meeting of hundreds of delegates from across the country when uh, there's clearly energy behind accepting the report of the study group on dismantling racism. Um, a de delegate uh, asked a question that I was unprepared for, and that was, you know, could we move this motion right now to make an eighth principle? And I said, well, I don't think so, but let's check with the parliamentarian who said, well, you know, you'd have to suspend the rules. Uh, <laughs> suspend the rules. <laughs> so he said, yes, if there's a vote of two thirds of the delegates, you can suspend. So I felt us going off into dangerous waters at that point. And uh, a mistake in retrospect that I made was to not uh, call a little caucus among those experienced parliamentarians to figure out what to do. If I had done that, we would have realized that th this action was actually out of bounds. But uh, I didn't realize it at the time. And so on we went. And I remember the um the text <laughs> in the midst of of the meeting um once once uh, rebecca had brought forward the motion are you seeing this did you hear that yeah so and beverly's then, at home and i'm at home and we're yes. presenting you know virtually and then suddenly what's going on yes you yes. know did you what's hear that? happening I, it, what are they and, doing and, right and then other members <laughs> of the study group doing the same <laughs> is this really happening i can't believe it can you believe it <laughs> we didn't anticipate this this is not what we asked for i'm so proud to be part of a faith culture a spiritual culture that lifts up and looks forward and outward to the point that we are even willing to talk about a new principle and to do that in a way that's inclusive and considerate and very real. I've been a, a pretty well a lifelong Unitarian since I was 14. And I also work in the area of change management. And I had been monitoring the process of the eighth principle lightly. Um, but certainly as I prepared for the AGM, I read the report and I, and I reflected deeply. And I was listening carefully to the interveners from the different congregations during the AGM. And there was one person who said really clearly, look, as Unitarians, you know, we, we, we think, we study, we research, we've studied this to death. It's time for action. And she was so frustrated. I don't even know if she's left the AGM or not. And at that point, I made a calculated decision based on all of the evidence that we have already tacit and in the report. I felt that the, that the CUC was ready to actually decide, do we put this for another year of reflection or do we actually put some action to this and take a decision? Are we gonna stand for an eighth principle or not? So I put the question out, I called the question and there was a quick discussion of Robert's rules of orders. You know, We know what happened that yes, we took a vote and that it wasn't allowable. However, it set the train in motion for this extremely important moment I was very excited and a bit nervous, but mostly confident that our Unitarian community can handle this. And that confidence um, is just, I guess that's part of my spirit work too, that I just, I knew that we would be okay one way or another, whether the principle went through it on its own or was addressed as part of a, a, an other agenda. Yeah, I was, I was confident that we would work through it coast to coast to coast, and then we did. I think the uh, right analogy would be, you know, when people are setting up the dominoes that go in different directions and then they, uh, they activate other things. I think that the congregations of Canada were the little silver ball 
that was ready. And I was the one that just went poke and the, the process evolved across Canada and led to, you know, the vote on, uh, in November. And, and I feel really good about that. It was diverse. It was complex. It stopped here. It continued there. It was, I think it was really important. So after that quick huddle, the spontaneous motion was ruled out of order by the chair. According to our process, prior notice has to be given so that congregations have time to discuss the motions and give feedback. But the delegates at that AGM voted to overturn the decision of the chair and the motion to adopt the eighth principle was put on the floor. Some delegates were concerned that their congregations didn't know about this motion and needed time to discuss this. Other delegates felt that it was past time that such a principle was adopted. In the end, the vote did pass by 63%. But the, the really sad moment was, and I was looking at one email, um, email exchange between um, me and Ashlyn. And Ashlyn had written, this is amazing. I, I wrote back, I can't believe it. And then just not that much longer after that, I can't believe this, this is horrible. Wow. Right? Once the, the, the vote was overturned. Um, and I remember doing the same thing. I went, went to my Facebook page as well. And I had one Facebook. Uh, in fact, I, it was a post that I made to the eighth principle um, learning community. And it was sort of like, a, wow, we did a thing. We did a thing here in Canada and I'm so proud of us. And only to, you know, within a half an hour, have to write back and say, um, due to technical we did issues, a we did a thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the sense of, of deep disappointment. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember whether I cried, but I remember being being fundamentally um, saddened by that and embarrassed. That was another part. That was another part of it. But immediately following the vote, I felt sick. Not because of the content of the motion, but because we had violated our own bylaws. The bylaws require that notice must be given of all business to be conducted at the AGM. And by allowing the vote to happen, we had clearly gone against our own bylaws. And so the result of the vote was void. But by allowing this, the vote to proceed, we had caused harm because hope had been raised and then we now had to find a way to make it right. But then bless our parliamentarian, our board, our our executive director um, for saying, yeah, but that doesn't mean that has to be the end of the story. Yes. Let's pick up and move on and mm -hmm. go on, find a way to pull this in within our bylaws, within the mm -hmm. rules of our bylaws mm -hmm. to acknowledge what happened in that meeting and the kind of response there was. The, the, the degree of accountability there was quite um, inspiring. Mm -hmm. The tendency is when process breaks down, um, that accountability part piece disappears mm -hmm. and everything goes back to, it's not in the bylaws, it's focusing exclusively on the, the process and that's supposed to be the end, of the, the end of it until you change the process, change the bylaws, whatever. But that, um, but that the board, um, said, no, this was, this was an error, this one's on us, and mm -hmm. we need to find some way to repair. Yeah. Right? That was quite extraordinary. That was quite extraordinary. And the board took it up as its, as its project. Right? So there was, on some level for me, there was some relief because it didn't fall on us like the two of us and the Disbanding uh, Racism Study Group to um, 
to deal with the the backlash. <laughs> right? It got it got pushed up a level, um, and and the board and Vita as the executive director, they they did the buck stops with us, yeah. and that was pretty extraordinary. I felt the whole process was and the project was validated in that moment in a way that I would not have anticipated. If I had to do it over again, <laughs> you know, I think we got to a better place than we were at. So it was my mistake that set us off on this journey, but we wouldn't be where we are today if that hadn't happened. So in the days that followed the AGM, communications were sent out to congregations explaining what had happened with an apology to the people harmed, especially to our Indigenous Black and people of color members and friends. I thought long and hard about what to say, how to say it, so that the message could get across that this was a mistake, but we wanted to make it right. So we proposed a special meeting in November of 2021 to consider the motion again. The CUC board and I felt that this would give congregations six months to consider the motion and to provide feedback. And this is one month more than our normal resolutions process. And due to the urgency and the importance of the notion, we really felt that this merited its own meeting, and we didn't want to put it off until the 2022 May Annual General Meeting. Interestingly, uh, the support in the audience was overwhelming. It was very clear that this is what the delegates wanted. Uh, so it was their spirit and their energy that uh, really, I think, helped those of us who were charting the course from there through the forums to the special meeting and ultimately to the final vote. It was that, that um, energy that they had presented at that meeting that uh, propelled us along and allowed us to get through this with 96% of the people voting in favor. You know, the, the concept of things being brought to crisis. Right. And it was that motion on the floor that brought things to crisis. Lost life. in that even was the fact that the board, I don't even know what date they did this, but mm -hmm. the UC board um, chose to affirm and adopt the recommendations from the Dismantling Racism Study Group, yes. just um, as one piece. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't just adopting the eighth principle, there were That's several right. other things. And mm -hmm. the board said, hey, we gotta move on these things and we're gonna work on them. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really important. And there was disappointment, hurt, confusion, and anger when the announcement was made that the resolution was not valid, especially among those who had supported the motion. Very strong opinions were expressed. Some of these were in objection to an eighth principle being adopted. Other concerns, um, people said that they were not happy with the language and whether this specific principle on dismantling racism fit in with the other seven principles. Other people were concerned about the time and uh, that there wouldn't have been enough time for congregations to consider the motion fully, especially over the summer months. And a lot of these strong opinions were expressed on the CUC's leaders um, email list. Some of those exchanges grew heated, accusations were made, some attacked the methodology of the survey, others didn't think an eighth principle on racism was needed, and other people suggested changes to the wording. During this time, many of our members and friends of color felt hurt, alienated, and isolated. In some congregations, differences of opinion led to conflict, to dissension, and to some members actually leaving. And yet there were many strong advocates for adopting an eighth principle, although the ones who were objecting to the principle 
spoke out far more. And what did this reveal about us? It showed us that we were not united as a faith community about dismantling racism. I was uncertain in the beginning whether we would be uh, able to do it. But at the end, I saw uh, um, that members were hungry for that, especially the younger members, the BIPOC members, that they wanted um, an eighth principle. They wanted a, a way to have a more inclusive, um, diverse community that represented the communities that they uh, live in. Well, it was, it, was, it was sort of on the one hand and on the other hand, on the one hand, I was so happy to hear of the overwhelming support for the eighth principle. And um, like the timing is everything because it came right after uh, George Floyd and the discovery of those unmarked graves uh, in the residential school in Kamloops. And, and this was perfect timing because everybody's thinking about it, it was the top of their mind. On the other hand, were certain people that were very resistant and um, couldn't really understand what the rush was or why it was happening. And um, were saying that this was tearing apart the church when I don't, I don't see that at all. I think it was more their refusal to just open their hearts and their minds to listen to the stories. That was more the issue, but um, on the whole, <laughs> the majority of people were, were behind this. I'd say that as a faith community, we are so much better at working uh, towards challenges and changes that are outside of ourselves than we are at looking inward and acknowledging our flaws and areas where we can improve. Whether it's fear or ignorance, or maybe even a smugness brought on by our past great works, it's hard to motivate changes required to move us forward when those changes are to ourselves. What was, uh, uh, again, happening was, you know, uh, when you see the discussions and on, online and things like that, it's, uh, it's the, very strangely, the capacity that uh, uh, not all, but many Unitarian Universalists, except, except especially those who are in leadership positions, the capacity they have to withstand uh, harsh criticism. It's, it's unbelievable, unbelievable, because, you know, there, there were like times where people said, you know, heavy things. And my admiration was, oh, this happened and people stayed on the table. That was to me a very good uh, show of some capacity to, to not just to withstand criticism, but to, to move forward and to grow and to live with uh, people who think differently. So that's, uh, that's something that I, I was very proud of actually to, to watch and say, yeah, this is good. You can see it from different sides saying, mm, maybe they stayed just to, to cause trouble. But at the same time, maybe they stayed because they love the movement. Maybe because they, they, want, they, want, they, they feel this is their home and they want to be part of its growth and part of its challenges and part of, uh, part of troubles, yeah. It's, uh, that's good. Because I come from a, a society which increasingly does not tolerate uh, the opposing view. And uh, uh, that's from the, from the, especially from the top, you know, the government, the military, the police, you, this, you say something they don't like, they kill you or they put you to jail or things like that. So it's like there is uh, some admiration for me of groups of people or communities that uh, showcase that capacity of saying, uh, I'm by saying horrible things I don't like, but I'm happy to engage with her. I'm happy to, to stay in the conversation. And uh, uh, in a way, I, that, was, that was also one, one thing that I learned. And I, I was very happy. So in order to move the conversation along, staff designed intentional spaces. We wanted to address the strong opinions and we wanted to help keep 
people safe. So we hosted five roundtable conversations for people to question, discuss, and express their opinions. And some of those who attended the roundtables continued to express their objection to the addition of an aid principle, while others were in support. And we discovered that we needed to provide a caucus space for people of color so that they weren't further harmed by these conversations as you use who are white continue to process their feelings and their opinions on this. Two of the CUC staff, Aaron Horvath and Amber Balmer, the social justice team created a series of forums that invited you use into conversation. They also created a responsibility covenant to help keep those conversations safe. You use were challenged during these forums to listen deeply to ask questions with curiosity, to refrain from judging. In short, we were asked to examine our own attitudes about racism and lean into discomfort. This was really hard for many of us. So we were approached by the Dismantling Racism Study Group to ask us if we would be willing to facilitate the forums. So there was four of them and we were asked, you know, could we take the national community on a, a journey through this? Um, not talking so much about the content as much as it is the hard work that would be required for people to um, really listen to one another to understand why some people are saying that there's an additional eighth principle needed. Um, yeah, so there, I mean, there was some interesting kind of conversations with people at the beginning where they'd say, but we already have these really great seven principles and we really like them. And if everybody did those, we should be fine and we, we wouldn't need an eighth principle. And it took us some time to sort of look at it together and go, okay, well, if we were really truly inclusive, um, we would know that because our congregations would be diverse and rich and it would be apparent, um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, is that those are a part, who are a part of the movement would say, I really feel included here. I feel like all of me can come to this community and be received and welcomed, that there's nothing I need to hide of myself um, that I can bring all of me. And since neither of those were true, then we kind of went and worked backwards and said, okay, so since those aren't true, then there's something that we need to be doing differently than what we're doing. And can we listen to each other to find out what that might be? And so that's kind of the, the heart space that we entered into those conversations with, as opposed to a head space that was just intellectualizing um, something based on you know, dogma that's written on a piece of paper. Right, and we used Covenant to create a container of respect and self uh, mm. um, control, I guess, I'm not sure what the word is, um, to be able to make sure that there was safety for the marginalized people in the rooms uh, and to make sure that we were speaking to one another through our own like self-reflective ways, using a mirror instead of a lens is one of the ways that we talked about it. Yeah, that responsibility covenant was, it was pretty key, right? Because that was saying that we want to show up in a way that gives space for other people to share what their lived reality is without them having to be cross-examined, criticized, intellectualized. We have a whole list, right? Um, that's, you know, basically saying to those with relative privilege in any given situation. So that can you know switch around, but in this case, we were talking about race and racism. So those of us with um, white skin people to be really thoughtful about what is coming up in us, our discomfort and not projecting that into the space in such a way that people would feel like, well, I can't really say what's true to me, my lived experience, because it might cause someone to get all hot and bothered about how they're feeling about that truth. So we really wanted to keep that um, in check yeah. for safety reasons. And, and we were told that that was a really important factor uh, in people feeling safe enough to participate in the forum. 
that. And then we also created the caucus group so that people did not have to be subjected to our processing, um, which did happen, you know, as we, you know, try to get a hang of using these sort of things, these sort of tools. Mm -hmm. um, it still certainly happened, but then they're not exposed to the, the weaponizing of, of some of our words that way. Change is always hard, and it's difficult to look within and acknowledge flaws and imperfections. For many members, Unitarian Universalism offers a refuge from a chaotic and sometimes hostile world. To actively seek out our flaws can feel destabilizing and thereby triggering a fear response. As we all do this work, which is really to expand that refuge to all people, those who are BIPOC, 2S, LGBTQ2+, to those who are physically and mentally uh, health challenged, to those who are socially and economically disadvantaged, and to those with non-traditional family structures. We need to respect this need for stability and continuity in our current membership, while also acknowledging the very real need to make changes that bring us into better alignment with our principles and allow us to live our values in the world. As I reflect on my own journey, I can attest to the importance of education and reflection and to the patience of others as I incorporated new information and new ways of viewing the world. I was one of many who voted against the eighth principle back in 2019, thinking it unnecessary and redundant. Over the following two years, I became an ardent supporter of the eighth principle and of the work it calls us to do through the grace and patience of those who took the time to educate me and through my own willingness to open my eyes to challenges facing those who do not enjoy my many privileges. We all have it within us to change and evolve, and it falls on those of us who are further along the path to reach back and help those behind us. I remember too, because we used the analogy of um, a group of people rafting down the river, all in different vessels, and um, you know, some saying, I'm gonna get out and go on the shoreline for a while, um, some people, you know, paddling like crazy, going through the, the intense waters and some staying in the calmer waters, whatever it was, right? And we talked a lot about the honoring of each other's journey and choice because some folks felt very mm, unsure, put off, uh, anxious. Some other. Sure, yeah, about the idea that we need to all be identical while we're doing this. And I think there was some comfort to recognize that as a society, we're in a river. It has a current. So one of the issues of our time is racism. And things are going to move regardless if you just sat in there or even paddled backwards. If you decide that's your, your shtick and you want to go the other direction, you can do that. The river is still flowing. And we don't have to do it all the same way. And we don't have to, to catastrophize thinking that if you know, a certain sector of our, our community um, decides they want to, to go forward quicker or, or stay back farther that, you know, suddenly we're, we're all apart or something like that, right? That still people will move at their pace and, and give people the freedom if they say, you know, I need to step off and, and journey on shore for a while by myself. That's okay. That's allowed. People confuse being unconsciously racially biased and having habits and um, behaviors that uphold racism, they confuse that with being a good or bad person. And I, I think it, I learned that um, we as a faith community haven't done a very good job at understanding that difference, understanding how, how to separate out behaviors and habits and um, things that we've that we've assumed were true from being a good or bad person. The general impression I got was once you explained what we were doing and why we were doing it, that most members were uh, on board. It's not really a story, but it's a, it's a something that uh, has been intriguing for me as a black person. Okay. And uh, living in Canada, where most Unitarian Universalists are white people. And so my question has always been, why white people are having this conversation? What is my role? 
what should I do? What should I be doing in the meantime? I haven't received an answer really, because these questions are difficult. They take a lot of time and they discuss about things that we, at least me, I have been going through, you know, uh, prejudices, racism, things. That's all, those are almost daily occurrences to me. And so when people are discussing that, and some even not even seeing it as a problem, what would they be doing? And uh, it has been a very uh, interesting question as I watch the process, as I participate in the process as much as I can, but at the same time as saying, it looks like it is not my process. It's not. And so while it is not my process, it, might, it is my movement. It is my community. So how do I put those things together? And last year in May, uh, during the, uh, the, 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 the ACM, or no, or after, when there were these conversations, I, uh, I asked one of the person who was leading, say, what would you like people of color to do while this discussion is happening? And uh, I did not have uh, a convincing uh, guidance. <laughs> not because the person was mean or anything. I, don't, I think he, uh, the person did not uh, see immediately what the uh, people of color are, uh, can contribute during this. I mean, apart from maybe sharing the experience and things like that, as the, 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 the conversation was going on. And the went was like going really tense and tense and tense. Uh, at least some people of color just tended to just withdraw and say, okay, let them deal with it and see what happens. And uh, I'm glad it, it went the way it went, but, uh, um, I, I, I think one of the things, the things I, I, one of the places I found solace was this uh, BIPOC group. You know, it was a, a, a space we could just meet and say what, what, how we felt and things like that while the conversation was going, was going on. Yeah. In Vancouver, I had formed a, a BIPOC group. And from that, the uh, community of the Unitarians, uh, Vancouver Unitarians formed a BIPOC and allies group, which is a huge group now and is taking over the job of uh, putting on events, which leaves the BIPOC group to do whatever we want and help or, you know, that sort of thing. So it's been really successful. As members, I think in a way we're not different in, than any other um, groups with individual members because we all have our fear, our hope, our, you know, um, wanting to hang on to what's comfortable, wanting to hang on to our power base. You are aware of it or not, because it's something you want to hang on to something familiar and then to be in that you are comfortable and accustomed to, including the colonial um, mentality, which you, you are brought up with. You know, you, you may, may or may not realize it, but it's deep down in you. So in that sense, um, any challenge to the status quo is very different, difficult. And we, that's why we see the pushback. That's why we see something sometimes uh, very visceral to the pushback um, as a community, which is a little, a little shocking. But again, when you think of it, it's good. It's better to have it out, you know, then you put it in and then simmer and, you know, and then one time will explode, it'd be even harder. This notion that we have seven principles, they are a reflection of everything um, that it means or should mean to be a um, Unitarian Universalist. And so therefore no need for an eighth. So this, this um, tendency to fetishize the existing seven as if there've always been seven, <laughs> seven principles. So one of the things that I did in all of the, the prep work for the special meeting is to talk about the evolution 
of, of the principles and draw everybody's attention to the fact that before 1985, we didn't even have seven principles, we had six. And the language of the original six was by the, the agency of feminists, right? In the 1980s, the, um, much of the paternalistic um, patriarchal language was brought into question and changed. Right? So this notion of it being um, a faith that's, that's constantly looking at itself, going through a, part, a um, process of revision, right? reflection, somehow got lost and it needed to be brought forward again during the process. Um, so that, I think it's, that also goes back to the one of the learnings, right? About the, the disjunction between our understanding of ourselves as being um, a faith tradition where, where revelation, rev, revelation is not sealed. So the distance between that and this, this um, tendency to reify, to fetishize, to codify right, all of those things, the principles that we had. So I, th that was one thing that I found very interesting and that was a learning, that was a learning as well. To be aware of what I've called the false equivalency, balance fallacy, there's different names for it, but it's this idea that, you know, person A is upset with what's happening and person B is upset with what's happening. And again, going back to, the anti-racism work, if, if there's a BIPOC person that's upset because they're experiencing racism in their congregation, and there's a white person that's upset because somebody's saying there's racism in their congregation, those aren't equivalent. And we often fall into the trap of treating them as if they are equivalent, as if though both of those perspectives are valid and of equal weight. And um, when we get into that, into that false equivalency, a lot of harm can be done because we were not sending the clear message that there's a big difference between being harmed and impacted by the experience of racism and being upset because you're being told that, you know, you've said or done something racist or that there is racism happening in your community. Those aren't equivalent. And um, how do you have conversations and help people understand that those aren't equivalent and that they require different, um, different levels of care and, and engagement? Uh, on a kind of a, a big level, right? Uh, looking at it from a, a distance is that there was at times a recognition of people of color playing certain roles. And then other times it was like their, their ethnicity just kind of disappeared in the, the eyes of, of certain folks, right? And so then there would be this undercurrent of resistance happening between people, but it was like, what is this actually about? So the fact that our executive director is a woman of color, but then is being put in a position of having to deal with all of this resistance from people about whether you know the eighth principle is necessary and all this extra work, that was something that actually brought up some resistance within a few different collections of people as they were noticing this and saying, hey, why are we talking about racism, but then we're putting the, the burden on not just our executive director, but there's other key people who are you know, people of color and we are shouldering them, putting them on their shoulders, this responsibility. So that, that was one area that I thought was interesting. The leadership in UU faith communities is far ahead of where the congregations are. I am so heartened and in love with our leaders and the beautiful and inspiring things they say, but I feel like our congregations are 20 years behind them. And I, I am wondering if it is worth my personal energy investment in, in that. I wanted to share my story as a religious educator during this time. It's been so hard 
because I personally am very strongly in favor of the eighth principle. Like it's really aligned with the work that I do in my life and like what I really feel to be my purpose in the world. And yet, because of the level of conflict within our local community, I had a really hard time knowing where to go with it with the children's programming because it's like I, I want to be in support of the principal and I personally can take that stance but then when we're talking about it from a collective perspective like you also want to represent your congregation so like I just I have puppet friends on Facebook and I was using them as teaching tools but it was so hard like there were many weeks that I didn't do a puppet show because I had no idea what to say like it was just impossible to know the approach to take um even though i know my own approach so i just wanted to add that as a story because like really being aware i think of the challenge for leadership when when conflict comes up it's like there's an internal uh division as well as an external division because leadership within community wants to represent the community and <laughs> they also want to do what they feel is the right thing. And that's a really difficult divide sometimes. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Nat Niall Mallet. I am 10 years old now. It started with uh, me getting asked if I wanted to do this Minecraft camp and I thought it was pretty cool. So I decided to do it. And basically every day they ask you about one topic at every camp. Uh, so, and then one day it was about this new principle. <coughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, we started kind of talking about what the new principle would be like. And uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. We got to talk about uh, letting every race and respecting every race. And I think it's really good that we finally have a principle that has to do with races. Uh, it was really exciting that we were gonna have a new principle. Mm -hmm. And I really uh, like the fact that it's anti racism. Yeah. Are there any reasons why? Uh, it's a first, the first reason, as you can see, well, I'm colored. So, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one of a different color, but there's kids from all over the country. I guess maybe really trying to think about everybody and how they might feel coming from other places. I think it's a wonderful thing that we have this new uh, principle. Yeah. yeah, I know. I really, I think it's very, very cool that my mom decided to uh, do this new uh, principle, especially anti-racism. It makes me feel really good and accepted. Maybe if you really don't, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to focus on it. You just have to be accepting and kind to everybody who's different. One thing that's interesting, sometimes people around me and in my congregation think that these issues are important because I have this beautiful, beautiful Ethiopian son. And of course that's true. But it didn't start 10 years ago. It's been for my whole life that I felt and thought this way. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, it's just an extension of what I already believe in. And I'm so excited that Natty's had an opportunity before the rest of us slow adults to explore these ideas of inclusion with the kids in our congregation because we're all different, but he's right. He's the only person of color. So you, you were, everybody has things to learn from everybody to them. It was a no brainer. Yeah. They were like, yeah, okay, do it. <laughs> it wasn't that hard though. In it fact, it wasn't that easy to get everyone in the vote. Yeah. Right. When we voted, he's like, wait, what? 
again, we're, de- we're deciding this again. You know, it was very interesting because Natty was already, the kids were already super happy in their hearts and I in their thinking. You. Yeah. You're, you're avant-garde. Um, uh, to be super honest, I was pretty upset about the whole thing. Um, I think I come from a bit of a, of a special perspective in that I am originally from the States. And so I saw this whole process happen, um, a few years ago in the States. And then I moved to Canada and, um, in a few ways, the like beautiful shell that is supposed to be Canada was broken as I realized that there are these problems that still exist here as well. And when you're from the States, you're always like, oh, Canada is like the golden promised land or whatever. And then you get here and you're like, actually, it's really not. And it was really hard to see that process happen all over again in Canada. And of course, the CUC voted to adopt while the UUA did not. And so there was that huge difference. But to go through that again was was really challenging and I really questioned whether or not I wanted to be part of this faith anymore as it was happening. And knowing how confused and honestly kind of ready to leave this faith that I grew up in, that I was towards the end of it, is still something that I am reckoning with. Like I had a lot of conversations with people about how if the eighth principle wasn't adopted, I would be leaving uh, my position and my my spot in this faith and so knowing that I said that and then I felt that and then now that you know they've adopted it and that's great but the process was hard and messy and gross and like not what I think it should have been it's just hard to to balance um I'm obviously still part of this faith I haven't left I'm still in my positions and I still love most of what I do but it was definitely like a big, um, it was a big challenge. It was a big struggle uh, in my faith development and my commitment to to this work and to this institution. I mean, a few years ago, I made a really big commitment that, um, well, so I'm a mixed person. I'm Iranian and white. And for a long time, I really saw my mixedness as a sign that I was supposed to be a bridge for white people. And that was really, really draining. And a few years ago, I made that that realization and I made a commitment to spending more time working in solidarity efforts and creating spaces for non-white people to feel uplifted. And, and that has really helped me feel reinvigorated in this spiritual work. Um, but of, of course, it's still hard even though it's not as draining as being a bridge or witness to the pain of, of especially, you know, black and indigenous and people of color who are, are less uh, privileged than I am, who, you know, maybe are darker skinned or, or less passing in whatever way. And to just witness that and deal with it and hold it and, um, and just sit with it has been, yeah, it's a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah. I remember talking about difference and it goes back to what I was saying about this sort of Canadian um, tendency to isolate along uh, national lines. And one of the things that we talked about was um, the, the primacy of um, colonialism in the Canadian experience of, of racism. Mm-hmm. So what do we do um, or that was the way, way in which this conversation would um, happen differently and how this issue of race would resonate differently in the Canadian context. And what's, what's been interesting for me is going forward is um, that we've lost, we've lost that element. Mm-hmm. And the focus has been on what's happened in terms of talking about um, Indigenous culture and racism as it affects indigenous people is that we've had this conversation about the distinction between racism and and colonialism. And that was something that I didn't anticipate when we'd had that discussion about um, how the eighth principle would help us talk about um, all the different forms of racism that exist in the Canadian context, anti-black racism and anti-indigenous racism as, 
as a category. Because in some ways, it's almost as if there's a continuum. Oh, no, it's probably not a polarity, really, of two different ways of seeing it. But I think we encountered in the conversations, both those who were saying, we're already doing this work. Look at what we're doing with truth, recon truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And those who said, say, why are we talking about the eighth principle? We should be talking about indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And then as we got more focused on the eighth principle, as you say, I think um, reconciliation and racism that's embedded in colonialism has taken a little bit of a back seat or has been made a little bit invisible by this mm -hmm. principle process, which mm -hmm. um, as you say, was never the intention or really the, um, nor is it true <laughs> or right that um, because the eighth principle is as much about truth and reconciliation with indigenous peoples as it is with, um, with all peoples. Mm -hmm. It's part of the CUC's regular process to ask congregations for feedback on motions proposed for annual meetings. And it was even more necessary in this case. So congregations were invited to share their opinions before that November 27th special meeting. And we got a range of responses, UUs being who they are. Most of these were in support of adopting an eight principle. However, there were, there were opinions that were not in agreement. And something that we don't normally do is share the feedback from congregations publicly normally, but we did do so here because of the complexity of the issues before us and because board and staff really wanted to make sure that the process was transparent and members were able to understand what other people were saying about the eighth principle and the process. So once the feedback was in, the CUC board and the Dismantling Racism Study Group met to consider the wording of the motion. So as originally proposed, it stated, and this is different from the version proposed by um, Paula Cole Jones to the UUA. Our original motion said, we, the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council, covenant to affirm and promote individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. So the board and the study group considered all the feedback and we returned to the focus and intent of the principle. We felt that it was important to include accountability not to, not to sideline oppressions beyond racism and to build actions for change in ourselves and our institutions. So we made a change in the statement and the updated principle reads, we the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council covenant to affirm and promote individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and in our institutions. We let the congregations know about this change. And then we also subsequently sent out um, communication about what we thought accountably meant and also what systemic barriers to full inclusion might mean. Uh, Robert's rules can be our enemy and our friend. And of course, it uh, works best when everyone in the meeting has an overview understanding of how it works. But of course, that's not the case. Many people don't understand its intricacies. Uh, one of the tricky options within Robert's Rules is this whole idea of a motion to call the question. And ideally, it comes at a time when people feel they've heard enough, that nothing new is to be said, and it's time for the vote. But an implication of calling question and, and maybe one that's not realized by everybody is that silence is the conversation. It's over. So we were in the midst of hearing a string of IBPOC delegates speak to uh, the topic when one of them called the question, not realizing that this would effectively silence her colleagues. So when she realized that, she asked if she could withdraw that motion. Well, I didn't know the answer to how you did that. 
And in the meantime, we had this other list of IBPOC people who really wanted to speak, who really needed to have their voices heard. So I said to the parliamentarian, well, how about if you research that question about whether we can repeal the calling the question. And in the meantime, we'll take a minute and listen to some of these other people. So it, uh, we were able to create an opening so that those people could feel heard. And I found myself on that knife edge of being respectful of the process and how the process needs to work. And at the same time, recognizing that there are real people here, people who are heavily impacted by this issue. And uh, so it was a moment for me uh, on the line as the leader. In the end, what I said to our community is, you know, it, the language the language is important, but it's not the most important thing. And it's the spirit of what we're trying to do. And it's the work that we're doing together and that we are committing to continue to do together that matters. And we can pass this. And then if we all just pat ourselves in the back and walk away, then we will not have accomplished anything. As you can tell, the time leading up to the November 27th special meeting was very challenging. Staff and board felt that the time we had invested in helping congregations and delegates prepare, while difficult, was both necessary and worthwhile. And at the special meeting, the 110 delegates voted 96% in favor to adopt that eight principle. Oh, uh, the fact that oppression is completely baked into the way that we do everything. And the number one thing that they should learn from what happened to us is that Robert's Rules of Order is a white supremacist garbage policy and you shouldn't use it. And uh, all of the other stacks of bylaws and policies and everything else is built in a white supremacist frame and needs to be ditched before we can do any real work. This process has taken a toll on us. It's taken a toll on us individually and as a faith community. It's exposed flaws and divisions within us, within our congregations, within and among our members. It's led to conflict, ill feelings and hurt. Our members and friends of color experienced harm and felt their experiences were being sidelined. Those who were not in support of the principle felt like their opinions were not taken into consideration. And it has also led to validation for our indigenous black and people of color members and a sense of relief that our faith community did show up and did take a position on racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion. For other communities that uh, would like to, to embark on uh, this kind of process that challenges uh, uh, status quo, they should always remember that this is good and just work. With that foundation, they will be able to, to withstand uh, difficulties, uh, misunderstandings, and they would like they would accept to stay on the table when things get tough. It, those of us who are white need to take a back seat. So sure. to listen yeah. and to, <clears throat> excuse mm -hmm. me to listen and to follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But I, I think the the collaborative element um, is important. Yeah. As long as <laughs> as long as the white person knows his or her place, <laughs> right? The white person is doing his or her work around identifying privilege and sitting with that and working on that. Listen to the the group that was being hurt. That, that the reason that there is going to be this push for a new principle or or any kind of change, um, you know, before it was women in the past, um, and then there was the LGBTQ community, and right now it it is the IVPOC community. And listen to them and and take leadership from them. Um, I think that's that, that's the best best way forward. Don't, don't assume that you know the, the way to do it. Like you have to listen to people, to those groups. The eighth principle journey in Canada is one I, I joined on midway. 
Um, but it had been started from a really long time, started in the US, of course, but also Canadian, racialized Canadians jumped, or not jumped on, but realized that it needed to happen here and uh, have been pushing this fight and have been do working hard. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, how it kind of, it just comes out of nowhere and it didn't. <laughs> it, was, it came from years of surveys and committees and discussions and more committees. Um, and I want to take the time to recognize the work that mostly racialized, but also some you know, white allies have done to get us where we are. Um, this didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen just with a snap of the fingers and everybody said, okay, um, there was a lot of work and a lot of fighting <laughs> and a lot of pushing that needed to happen. And I, I respect that. And I'm so happy to be a part of that group and that movement. One of them is I believe something that I think I think you said it, or I'm going to paraphrase it, but essentially about, um, you know, uh, when we overprocess things, we are thinking with our like colonial brain. And when we're doing this work, we need to be thinking with our feelings or like feeling with our feelings and not thinking with our, you know what I mean? Um, so, so separating the brain from the heart uh, and, and focusing on the heart is step one uh, and then two is is to remember to bring in joy and play and to have fun because the heavy lifting is only heavy when you're not also having fun and you make change by having fun and that's one of my biggest criticisms of most political movements is that they forget to have fun with it and it's like i'm not working for a world where no one's having fun. <laughs> so you have to incorporate that into the process of doing this change or else it's gonna to be too much to, to bear and too much to deal with and you're gonna burn out. My biggest takeaway is the ongoing need to be humble, to acknowledge and grapple with my privilege, um, to be willing to put um, the places where I might feel marginalized as a woman and a woman of a certain age to recognize that um, that's a very different experience than it is for people who um, have been marginalized and um, oppressed in different ways. Um, and to continually remind myself that My ego is not what my life, that I want my life to be about. So that my need to be centered, to have a voice, to um, be privileged, um, to expect things to be handed to me in the way they have been all my life um, is not what I want my life to be about. And so it takes a very intentional ongoing, because it certainly isn't over, I certainly haven't learned it all, but it takes a very intentional commitment to that work and to keep um, um, asking for forgiveness, forgiving myself, moving on, um, taking the next, um, going on to the next thing um, as best I can. Um, it's hard work. And I think that's my biggest takeaway is that not only is it hard work, but that I have it in me to do it and that I do want my life to um, be about that work. The, the biggest takeaway is that all the, the vast majority of members want full inclusion. Um, and uh, it's just a matter of helping those few members that are still um, hesitant about things like adding an extra principle, especially if they think the seven principles already uh, cover that area. It just takes a little bit of time and education and uh, encouragement for those people to come along as well so that all of us move forward with the with uh, uh, the principle to dismantle uh, systemic racism, which um, 
I feel is consistent with Unitarian um, principles so that we can't skip that part because it's easy to ignore um, what's happening in our communities. And uh, I think given the events, we did this when uh, George Floyd um, was shot. And I think that really, there was many things happening before that, but even in Canada, <laughs> that was a, a wake up call that um, whatever we were doing before wasn't working and we needed to address um, systemic racism in a more pointed way, or else we would continue traveling down a road that we didn't want to go into. And I was very heartened to find that um, it, our uh, Unitarian Universalist congregations understood that too. Um, and then the other big lesson, at least for me, was how little we as a faith have put into building the skills and the capacity to navigate conflict generatively, to restore relationships when they are harmed. Um, and that gap, that, that missing piece has become very clear to me over the experience that I've had of trying to engage people on the topic of anti-racism. You know, there's, <laughs> I used to have dogs. I don't have a dog anymore, but I used to, I had dogs for most of my adult life. And um, I always loved the card that people often share. Maybe it's a meme now or whatever. That's, you know, that I want to be the kind of person my dog thinks I am. And, um, you know, that kind of sense of like, I think that's what our faith calls us to do. It's to be the kind of person that our faith calls us to be. And so much I feel inadequate. But that ongoing kind of a reminder, this is what I, this is who I want to be. This is how I want to live my life. This is what gives my life meaning. Um, and there are many things, many causes in each of our principles. And each of the things our faith is about that call us to be that person um, that our dog or in that dyslexic way our God wants us to be, thinks we are. Um, and this one is one that just really calls my heart forward. And so um, I'm really honored. I feel really, talk about privilege, I feel really privileged to have found something that touches me in this way and um, shapes my life. And, and, and supporting communities with being just uncomfortable. It's gonna be a thing, because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me, it's uncomfortable for all of us, and it has been uncomfortable, right? So like, let's get uncomfortable and let's create spaces where discomfort is not something to be afraid of, but really a place where we can learn and be curious. So I would, I would really say, I would really lean into the transformative possibilities of discomfort, what's there and how can we support communities and support each other with that discomfort? For you and I and the members of the Dismantling Racism Study Group that kind of helped to lead this forum, I think there has to be an understanding um, kind of like that river metaphor that you're going into something and there will be turbulence, right? There will be that, the rapids, and it will feel a little bit like um, we're losing ourselves in this. But if we, like what we were trying to do is to get to the root of the, the spiritual principles and hold ourselves to that and let that be our compass so that even when we're going topsy-turvy, that we have that as a reference Point to come up with and we had our indigenous elders hold that and guide us and, and they they created a container for the event and so it wasn't a, a free-for-all intellectual exercise it was a spiritual journey that we were were going on together with the understanding that in in relation to those spiritual principles of inclusivity of you know respecting each other's journeys these sort of things that none of us are exempt 
So it's not about like one group of people trying to who believe themselves to be more evolved, <laughs> trying to convince some other group of people to, to see it their way, right? And that can go in any, any which direction. That I think was um, foundational for the success of our, our forums is that, um, you know, we've, we've managed to still continue to keep the conversation going um, without people feeling like they're completely um, alienated through this process. It was a journey and we have managed to keep ourselves together like that, that caravan of, of rafters. So uh, leadership in my mind is about realizing what needs attention and uh, going to that place, figuring out what needs to be done, and then figuring out how to get it done. And I think our uh, eighth principle process was really all about that, to keep our tradition a living one, to make it relevant for our time. And despite all the good words that we had, to come up with new words that are needed for this time. Uh, over the last few years, we've come to a realization that, uh, and it's settling in on us, many of us mainstreamers, that within our congregations and throughout our uh, country, racism is here. Uh, its presence has been hard to see and accept, but I think now the evidence is overwhelming. And so with seeing that evidence as being a tradition that values evidence, it becomes incumbent on us to step up and create change. And so in the idea of being a living tradition, we embarked on that project. What I'm, what I'm hearing from, from young racialized people is how much the fact that, we've, that we passed the eighth principle, the fact that we did this work together, the fact that we had these forums together, that is bringing them back into the faith. And that just gives me so much hope. It makes me feel like, okay, we're, you know, as hard as this is, and as hard as it can be some weeks to think, okay, you know, do, can we take a break? Can we stop? Um, and then I, then I look at these young folks and say, okay, um, this, this is what we, this is what we are called to do. If we are going to be a, a living tradition that responds to the world around us, and within ourselves, then this is, and, and it's worth it because, you know, it, it's, it just speaks volumes to the, the, the young racialized people who are in our congregations in particular. The approval of the eight principle announced to the world that the Canadian Unitarian Council and that Canadian Unitarian Universalists are willing to do the work of dismantling racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion. It will not be an easy or a smooth path, and it will continue to cause discomfort and turbulence. We share this process with the UUA, although we realize that the process for changing your bylaws is very different from the CUC's process, but we hope that what we have gone through here in Canada will help inform your Article 2 study commission process and findings. And for us, the eighth principle will remain a priority for the CUC. As we go forward together as a faith community, we are finding ways to remain in covenant together, to hold ourselves and each other accountable, to aspire to be radic radically inclusive, and to dismantle systemic barriers to full inclusion. I thank and appreciate everybody who has been with us for this part of the journey, and especially for those who continue to engage with us, even when it was very difficult to do so. Awesome.